You could have just had the best training cycle of your entire life, but if you don't execute on the things I'm about to talk about, you could underperform or worse, just have a total disaster of a race. But I am here to help you and we're gonna start with one of the things that I see runners get wrong all the time. Research has shown over and over again that when we're dehydrated, we cannot perform as well. To start off, one of the reasons is because our blood volume drops and to make up for this, our heart rate gets a little bit higher. To add to that, electrolytes, especially sodium, they help maintain our fluid balance. And electrolytes also aid in metabolic activities such as muscle function. So in other words, when we're dehydrated, our muscles fatigue faster and our muscle contractions aren't as strong. A lot of people confuse bonking and dehydration. Bonking, not always, but often comes on more suddenly. Uh, a lot of people you probably heard will say it feels like hitting a wall where dehydration feels more like a slow death. You just kind of feel like over time, you just keep getting uh, a little bit more tired as you go on and your legs might start feeling heavy and it's more just that feeling of tiredness or for some people, uh, leg heaviness or you just can't get your muscles to work how you want them to. And so those are just kind of the signs to look for uh, maybe in past races or your current training to tell when you're starting to get dehydrated. So now some of you might be asking, what does this actually look like in training or racing? How much should I be taking in? When it comes to electrolytes, specifically sodium, it, it's highly variable on the person. Um, some people, you might only need like 300 milligrams of sodium per hour, while there are quite a few people on the high end of the, high end of the spectrum who need like a thousand milligrams of sodium per hour, at least in endurance events. Um, so when you're looking at races over an hour, two hours plus, the general consensus on research or in the research I've seen is that most people do pretty well between 500 to 700 milligrams of sodium per hour. Again, this is highly individual. You want to test it out in training. You can also go and actually get um, a sweat test done. Um, you can actually have somebody perform that on you, like go into like a lab and stuff like that. Um, there are uh, sweat patches that you can try out. Um, I know a couple of companies make those. I do suggest if you get like a sweat patch to get a couple just so you can do multiple tests on yourself and get make sure you're getting something accurate because um, sometimes things go wrong with just one test. So it's good to test yourself multiple times. Then just experiment with it during your training runs. Now, if you're just going running for like an hour easy and it's pretty like cool weather, you don't have to hydrate. You might want to prehydrate a little bit, but I'm definitely talking for long runs or maybe just really hot runs. Experiment, experiment with this. When I started applying this to my own training, the biggest thing I felt was, yeah, I felt stronger at the end of the run, but my energy was better during the run and also after the run. And I see that with a lot of people. You just especially in the summer, people just get done with a run and they just feel exhausted and wiped out for hours. Yeah, sometimes running just tires you out, but a big part of that was just being dehydrated. As I said before, dehydrated, dehydration can make you feel tired. When it comes to fluid consumption with the electrolytes, so how much water you're mixing in with the electrolytes, again, it it's very... Um, dependent on the person and for sure on the temperature with this one. Even more so than electrolytes, temperature matters here. Uh, I would say most people, um, 17 ounces of fluids per hour on a cooler day. If it's a hot race, you know, going up to 30 ounces plus. But this is something you need to play around with and you can feel out maybe feel out a little bit more during your race and long runs. If you're doing road races and you rely on the aid stations, 
look up to see what electrolyte drink the race has in advance because you'll want to practice with that. And you might find that you really don't like it. And in that case, um, what you can do is just drink the water cups and carry something with like salt, um, these salt caps with you. Um, that's a really good solution if you know you don't like the race drink. For road races as well, if you're grabbing the aid station cups, I know that's not easy to do. You'll want to practice that with in training, like maybe set up a table um, and do loops so you can like keep hitting that table and grabbing cups. Um, the trick is it still takes practice. As you grab the cup, you pinch the top of the cup right away and then you kind of take sips out of it better than not getting any water and just having the water splash all over your face. So practice that during training. Moving on to something else that can make or break your race and that's race day nutrition. I'm gonna talk about actual fueling during the race but I wanna make sure people realize this includes what you're having the day before the race and the morning of a race. People have, especially people who have sensitive stomachs, what you have the day before and the timing of it can matter a lot. I've seen quite a few people with sensitive stomachs change the timing of their meals and just changing, maybe even changing their meals a little bit too to something lighter make a huge difference. So the day before the race, you know, people might want, if you have a sensitive stomach, especially during races, you might want to have a bigger breakfast and lunch and then a lighter dinner. And your timing of dinner is important as well. Like for instance, Somebody um, I coached, they were used to having their dinner at like 8 p.m. the night before the race. They changed it to 5 p.m. and that worked much better for them. And it makes sense because it just gives your stomach more time to digest. Also, the day before, you might want to prehydrate a little bit. Um, maybe not for everybody, but depending on the race, you might want to prehydrate with like a lighter electrolyte drink. Um, and you also want to consider what you're eating. Don't have something new. You should be having something your stomach is used to and you've practiced before long runs or speed workouts before. Um, with the morning of the race, uh, there's often a dilemma whether you should sleep more or wake up early and get in a breakfast. If you do have a sensitive stomach and you've had issues during your race, I would suggest wake up early and having breakfast two to three hours plus before a race and again you want to make sure this is a breakfast you've tried out for some people if you're like me I typically have a pretty big breakfast and I'm totally fine running but before a race for whatever reason I can't have the same breakfast I have to go with something lighter I don't know if it's the nerves or what, but I typically go with a lighter breakfast than I'm used to, just have my cup of coffee and then um, hydrate up to the race and that works so much better for me. Um, so again, if you have some sensitive stomach or just have had issues in the past, these are all things to consider. Moving on to actual in-race nutrition, I'm talking about in, in like what you're taking during the race, but this is going to apply for pretty much all your long runs leading up to the race and even some speed workouts, you'll want to test this out because sometimes what works during easy runs does not work when we're trying to run fast and really push ourselves to our potential. So what the research has changed a little bit on this in, in recent years. Current research is showing that if we can get at least 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour, again, for endurance events. So even for like a half marathon now for, um, for people and up, you want to try to get into 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour. Some research has shown that if you can get up to 120 grams per hour, that's, that's a lot of calories and a lot of people can't do it. But if you can do it, that has shown to have performance benefits as well. Um, and that's really why this is being suggested, suggested for the performance benefits and what the research is showing that this can also help prevent muscle breakdown. So if you look at your gels, like a lot of gels are around um, 100 calories. So this one um, from Univet, it's 110 calories and it has 26 grams of carbohydrates. So 
that's kind of your first step, uh, right, is to look at the nutrition products you're going to use during the race and kind of do the math. So I would need to hit 60 grams, I would need over two of these gels to do that. Um, for some people, you might only be able to take two gels per hour, um, but if you practice and train with it, you can build up and you can even mix um, some electrolyte drinks have uh, carbohydrates in them and gels that can work really well for a lot of people to get your carbohydrates from from a little bit from drinking and then from gels or real food or whatever. Um, that could be a really good plan. I know a lot of people, a lot of people I started coaching, they could barely take a gel an hour but then we kept trying new products you know, or we played around with it even the, again their timing um, of when they ate before a long run um, and we pretty much for everyone I've always at least been, be, been able to build people up to at least 50 grams of carbohydrates per hour um, and then from there, like 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour is definitely within reach, but you have to play around with it and you have to practice. I know some people have iron stomachs and they're like, yeah, I can do that, no problem. I could even do um, 100 grams of carbohydrates per hour, no problem. But I know a lot of people aren't like that. And it's important to know also that, you know, some products might work for you, um, other products might not. Um, like some people have something called fructose malabsorption and you can't have a lot of fructose in your products because um, it just bothers your stomach. And so play around with what you're having. And again, if you're relying on aid stations, make sure you look up what aid stations have and practice that really with every single long run that you do. I know at least one person right now is asking, well, what about fat burning during long runs? And that's a great question. I know that got a lot of attention in the past, but if you wanna practice fat burning for running, the best thing that you can do is taking your easy recovery runs easy enough. Staying in that fat burning zone during your easy runs, by far number one thing you can do. And then that way you can just not just focus, but really focus on making sure you are nailing your race day nutrition on every single long run. And again, you can do this on some speed workouts too. Take a gel in the middle of a speed workout and just make sure your stomach can handle it. For more coaching on pacing, on nutrition, on mindset, check out the Ultimate Running Course, Coach Yourself to Your Highest Potential. It goes into depth about all these things and so much more. And there's also training plans on the website, website 5K to 100 miles. Um, we've got personal coaching. So if you're looking to improve your running game, check out higherrunning.com.